we're going to start a new thing, um, and it's okay if some people miss today and we just have to get them caught up because we got, we got a little time on this project. I'm, I'm giving you a couple of weeks. I really wanted to start on Tuesday, so that threw off kind of where I wanted to, to roll with everything. Um, what did you guys discuss with Joey on, on Tuesday? Mainly the T6i. He's had a T6i or a T5i for a really long time um, and has done a lot of really great projects with it, uh, especially his macro photography. If you ever are curious, look up Joey's Instagram page. Uh, he was shooting just beautiful stuff for a really long period of time there that, that he laid out. So he understands the camera really intricately. Um, but he also, what, one of the things is, you know, you start off with our kit, with our simple DSLR and our uh, kit lens. But one of the things he did, instead of upgrading on the camera, he started upgrading on his glass or his lenses. And I think that was something that helped really propel some of his creative uh, direction was because he started getting specific lenses towards um, things that he was trying to do. We've talked about how these lenses are good for a variety of purposes not great for everything, not for every single scenario. So I think one lens he bought was like a 100 millimeter prime lens that just shoots a really nice image. Um, but it's so specific that it doesn't work for all these other things. Um, do you guys have any thoughts or questions from Tuesday for me not being here? OK. I want to I'm going to cover a few things. And I don't want to hold you guys too long because I want this weekend to be more of a chance for you to think about what you want to do. Um, and I do want to also encourage you to work in groups on this project, but you definitely do not have to. Um, so over the weekend, um, Tuesday will really kick in. I'll do another lecture, and then I'll give you two days to work in the studio or in the lab, and then we'll screen two weeks from now. Um, and I'll go over all of that again here a little later. <clears throat> um, but what I, what I want to do first is show you guys, hey, Aaron. Hey, Andrew, I want to show you guys first a couple of competitions that are out right now that I think you guys would be uh, at least interested in um, and maybe even really competitive in if you, if you have the time to put towards it. Um, I'll start with the one I know oops, a little bit more about because this one, this one also ends sooner. Uh, <clears throat> Ironically, this one could be done in conjunction with this assignment if you chose to, because it's an editing competition. However, you are allowed to film up to, I think, 50% of it. Uh, Alex Rodriguez, he's in post two and cinematography, um, our uh, advanced student. He's been kind of digging into this. He's doing this competition. So if any of you know Alex, he runs the lab a lot of nights. You might ask him about it. The film supply is who's putting it on. They are a uh, stock media site. So that's where they, that's really kind of what they're known for. But every year, I believe they do this yearly, they put on this competition. Um, and they have three categories. <clears throat> so it's 30 days. It started earlier in the month. That shouldn't discourage you, though, because these are really short edit projects where you could absolutely jump in and, and cut this thing over, over one evening if you really focused in. So you get, a, <clears throat> you get a download link after you sign up. You have to put in your email. It's all free. I don't like to show competitions to you guys that are, are uh, expensive or costly. This one is going to take you more time, and they get a lot of publicity out of it. So I don't think they've ever charged for this. But once you get your, you get your starter kit, you can see down here, um, that gets sent to your email. You download that link, or you grab that link, and then you download up to 75 clips to make your project, but you can also shoot your own stuff. So if you wanted, you could enter this competition with the footage that you shoot in this assignment. And this assignment and this competition end on the same day. So an option there. Um, I think it's really, really good for everybody to enter these kinds of things as frequently as you have the time and ability to. Uh, these competitions allow you to be really, really creative. Hey, Dayton. And um, they get you out to a, a whole new audience. So they have a lot of judges that review these different uh, projects. And they come from different backgrounds. And I'll explain why I believe that is. Um, so some of these guys work for Amazon, Nike, Facebook, Toyota, 
The Undoing, The Witcher, that's probably more the actual series. Um, I thought it was going, eh. uh, Nike, Samsung, Netflix, Amazon. So um, they have different, they have different uh, roles and where they came from to get to this point. But these judges, this is all great publicity for you. So let me show you a couple of, and of course, there's a lot of prize money. Um, I've never won anything. I haven't done a lot of these personally, but I had a friend win a couple grand and like a camera package from one of these competitions a while back. And it was same scenario. He had to use so much of a percentage of what was provided from the, the yeah, I think it might have been this one. It was similar for sure. Um, from whichever stock media site, he had to use so much of theirs, but then he was able to shoot some of his own footage with his Canon DSLR. Um, and he did a, did a beautiful project. I wonder if I can get him to let me show that in class. Oh, here we go. So you have three different categories. And any of these could work for sure in our project that I haven't even touched any uh, information on for you yet. But you start with title sequence. Let's go ahead and watch these. They're all really short. This is the winner from last year, I believe. So that one's just one minute. This was the title sequence, if you uh, forgot. <clears throat> they typically have um, specific or rules. I shouldn't say restrictions. Eh, restrictions too. But um, like one of the rules is usually they give you this graphic, the film supply, edit fest graphic that has to be added. So one of the things I also like about competitions is that gives you rules that you have to be guided by the same way that a, a client or a producer, your boss, um, or even just yourself might need when you're doing a project. So it's good to like start implementing those kinds of things as you, it's just, like good practice to always have those things. Hey, Adam. Um, <clears throat> so for the title sequence, just basically with any title sequence you would see before any series or before you'd see any feature film. We typically don't do a title sequence in short films. Um, usually you wanna jump right into the story a lot quicker. So. You typically have the production company, as they did. But you can make up all the names and stuff. Like, this doesn't have to be after a real series. So if that sparks any ideas. And, I would, and you can see it has still imagery as well as motion. Oh, no, that was, maybe that was a glitch. And I'm not certain on this one, but I, I think the music is provided through them as well. So that was a title sequence. <clears throat> and here the definition, title sequence, title sequences are an art form. They set the tone and tease the journey. They can suck a viewer into the story before it even begins. Ultimately, to win this category, you'll need to meet one simple goal, create a title sequence that's impossible to skip, um, which I think is kind of a, an interesting way to hit that. Because before Netflix, it wasn't even an option to skip you know, you couldn't fast forward past the title sequence. Now, how many of you guys skip that right away whenever you're streaming? Yeah. You watch him? Yeah. I think. Like, if it's like Better Call Saul and stuff with short intro, it's always. Ah, OK. Yeah, that's a great example. I, I like to, if it's a series that's in a new season and they updated it, I usually want to see it out of curiosity. Um, South Park tends to update it each season, but it's usually not really a different, it's not different necessarily you know it's still the same people the same song same band but they change it up a little bit and I'm always kind of interested in what 
little things they'll throw in, a lot of hidden uh, Easter eggs and stuff. Um, but that's a great example of why you may not skip it. <clears throat> then they have an advertisement category. I think all these run one minute, which is okay for our assignment if you chose to connect it. The quality of a Japanese play has never been surpassed. For a master's man, the go is perfection. The byproduct, a work of art. The ore is hammered and folded continuously. Craftsmanship perfected through generations. As the blade exits the cold one final time, it leaves the smith with a question. Is this a piece of art worthy of my name? The beginnings of a soul crafted in steel. The master smith nods with approval. So um, this one was for an advertisement. <clears throat> the quality of a Japanese blade has I really love when they can uh, incorporate archival stuff within brand new cinematic, uh, you know, the 12K era that we're capable of shooting in. Um, there's still a lot of value uh, visually and storytelling wise in old footage and some of these media um, stock sites tend to have, have a lot of that. It's never been surpassed. For a master's list, the go is perfection. The byproduct, a work of art. The ore is hammered and folded continuously. Craftsmanship perfected through generations. As the blade exits the cold one final time, it leaves the smith with a question. So it's a really great job of um, combining, you know, the, the manufacturing of a sword into a car ad. Uh, just really cool. Uh, let's see, what was the definition of this? An effective ad has a hook. The hook has a solution to a customer's problem, presented in a way to that compels action, whether it's lipstick, a sports car, or a bag of dog food. Everybody's looking for something. Show them you have what they need. And then the last one of movie trailers, the last category that you could do if you wanted to try this. Uh, cutting a superior movie trailer requires restraint and balance. You have to draw an audience in, but you can't give anything, everything away. How will you reveal an entire world filled with conflict and resolution in only 60 seconds? I, I imagine 60 seconds is what you're supposed to hit on all of these. <clears throat> And that one was under 60, so maybe 60 seconds is the max. <clears throat> well, for those of you who are kind of trickling in, these, there's a couple of competitions that are out currently, or about to be out, that I'm gonna show you guys. The first one um, from Film Supply. It started at the beginning of September. There's no reason that any of you guys couldn't absolutely knock something out uh, by the time this particular project is done. Our project is gonna be composition. And with this particular competition, you can put up to 50% of your own shots in. So you could combine this and turn it in uh, to you know, enter the prizes and things like that and get your work out there. 
So you do not have to, uh, not for this class. I know some other classes might be looking at it as well. And so again, Alex Rodriguez has downloaded the kit and he's started playing with it. He knows a lot more about the rules than I do. Um, he kicked it off the last day of the fair Sunday when we were here parking cars and no one was coming in. We started looking into this. So I highly encourage you to look at these kinds of opportunities uh, because it really incites a lot of great creative uh, flow. You can really try things that maybe you haven't got to try in class. Um, and, I, and you're going to want to try other stuff outside of this program for sure because we hit you with a lot of stuff in two years. But it is by means nothing close to everything you're going to learn in the industry when you're out working. Um, we're sparking a lot of interest. We're sparking a lot of uh, uh, base knowledge. But you're going to see a lot more stuff come around um, that I won't have time to teach you in just a few semesters. So these kind of competitions are really, really great for that. <clears throat> Questions about this that I likely can't answer because I think I've given you everything I know. Um, but if you're really curious, Alex, and he's around a lot, he should be here um, later today. He's been messing with it for the last few days, so he might know more about the rules and things like that. The other one, and I believe this is a typo, says contest 2022. Um, I just got this, I think, while I was out sick um, in my email inbox. I do not know nearly as much about it, but I believe it starts next month. Um, so submissions begin October 21st. I believe you get a month here, so until uh, December 21st. <clears throat> and it looks like there's four days in the announce. I have not had a chance to dig into this one nearly as much, um, but I believe it is also free. Now, I do not know how to pronounce this brand, but they make um, lenses. They're a lens company instead of an editing company. Their lenses are really pretty awesome. I haven't got to use them a lot, but they they make uh, some anamorphic lenses and things, stuff that we won't get into too much this semester that typically cost in the 15000 and up range, and they, they make them actually affordable. They make them under 2000 So I've, I've really appreciated this. This company kind of came out, at least in my uh, at least under my radar, around COVID time, and then it kind of fluctuated in and out. So I tried to order some of them for the program, and then I couldn't get anything in uh, for that period. So I'm not too sure a whole lot about this particular competition, um, but it's another one that's out, and it will not begin until next month. So what's great, the reason I wanted to point it out today and kind of throw it onto your radar is the fact that you would probably want to work in teams on something like this if it's not just a full-on editing competition. They probably want you to shoot more stuff. And you guys are in a group. You're all sitting here learning this stuff together. Uh, this could potentially be our assignment next month. If I, if I read through the, the stuff and it makes sense for what we're trying to do, then we might use this as kind of a platform for us to base our, our uh, a project on, not the project on. Um, so I wanted to put that one <clears throat> on your radar. Uh, and yeah, they contacted, they emailed me just yesterday or the day before, but I'm, I don't know, seeing, seeing some typos and stuff, it may not be as official of a competition as what we have with the film supply one, because I know this one is yearly. Um, well, here's some rules. Let's just read through it real fast. The video should be at least 60 seconds. Let's see. So you upload it to YouTube or Instagram. Don't do Instagram. It says with their particular lenses, but I didn't see that in the rules. So I don't know. Maybe this one <clears throat> isn't exactly what we want to dig into. Uh, but also the point to it being that there's a bunch of competitions all throughout the year that different film, uh, it could be a film festival putting it on. It could be, in this case, a lens company. Um, or an editor or a stock media company, keep an eye out for this stuff. It's great ways to, to really hone in on your skills and try new stuff and get your work out there. Um, and if they require us to use those particular lenses, maybe we could figure out something where a lens would be rented or something. There's always a way if you dig hard enough. Um, let's see if I 
can find one for rent fast. By the way, our internet is blazing fast in here right now because we've got the we've got the network put in. It's been a construction project that we've been trying to get implemented for five years. So here's some of their really great, great lenses that I wish I had more experience with. And so it looks like they're like very affordable. 50 bucks a week, which would actually cost more like 100 because you have to pay for insurance and shipping and stuff. So I don't know, something to put on your radar. Yeah, Dayton. So like, what is the uh, I mean, that's a good question that goes way outside of where we're going to go today, but I can show you uh, I, can, I can show you in some anamorphic examples. Because that's what they're known for, is their anamorphics, for the most part. <clears throat> Basically, it's really great. It'll spread an image out. Um, you see a lot of anamorphics in cinema now where they have, you know, this looks like a nice. So you kind of get this, it spreads out the image um, and, it really, and it really defines her in the front and kind of softens everything back there, giving you a really low depth of field. It's really common to see these when you're looking at, if you ever see the light kicking through an image like this, whenever you see this effect where the light's kicking through the sides, that's an anamorphic effect. That's pretty common. I've actually requested some anamorphics uh, so that we could try to implement them into some of our work, but haven't had any luck so far. That's one way to really identify it, but basically it stretches your, it's going to take your image and it actually squeezes it together and then in post you pull it out. And it's um, a pretty complex process compared to what you guys are doing right now. But that's why in a month or so it might be interesting to, to try and implement that. So something that we can consider. <clears throat> and they are now affordable to rent. This used to be way, this was not even conceivable before. Okay. So the, the film supply competition, that's the one that I do highly encourage you to look into if you are interested. Um, that's not what I'm trying to do. For the actual assignment that we're jumping into, <clears throat> and you'll see where this could potentially play into that competition because you can shoot your own stuff. Um, we're going to be doing a little bit of shot planning, but this is a pretty small assignment. So the shot planning will be uh, very elementary in this, just guiding you into what a shot list and a storyboard or a storyboard could be. More or less, I'm more worried about what we're talking about with what's in the frame. Is it a tight shot? Is it a medium shot? Is it a wide shot? And then how do you catalog that when you're doing your, your shot listing? So <clears throat> you will assemble a short sequence of roughly five to 10 shots. You can work with a partner. You can work solo. I do not mind. Um, I encourage you to start working in teams if you are interested because that'll help with camaraderie, it'll help with production value, um, ideas, uh, also being open to ideas. Uh, you'll begin with an establishing shot. I'm going to explain what all this is. That shows the audience where the story is taking place, followed by a medium shot or a tighter shot than the establishing uh, to convey action moving in. And then lastly, you'll finish with a close-up shot to show the emotion of what the effects of that action was. Um, and in between, you can utilize insert cert shots to help reinforce the story. This one doesn't have a time limit. <clears throat> I do not want it to be super, super long. I just want it to be long enough that we can tell where you're at, who's included, what is happening, and what the emotion is. Um, I want you to create a shot list or a storyboard. You do not need both. Uh, sometimes people like to do both. You do not need both. Uh, for me, I don't use storyboarding very often because oftentimes I'm a part of the camera team. So I really like storyboarding. If you're a writer and you have this vision or if you're a producer and you're hiring a DP that or you're not even sure who that might be yet, might, uh, you might work with, a shot list is really great to convey that visual with everybody if you're not going to be the one behind the camera. Uh, 
or if you need to convince somebody of what you're trying to, maybe you want to show your actors what you want them to do. But I like a shot list personally. That keeps me organized. I like to check it off as I go down. I got this shot, don't need it anymore. I got this one, I don't need that anymore. Um, it helps me stay organized. So one or the other, if you are working in pairs, you only need to turn in one. And your shot list or storyboard will need to include the type of shot and the framing. <clears throat> I'll come back around to this. Uh, so basically, MCU, medium close up, over the shoulder. You guys have two weeks on this, it'll all make sense. And then you'll just turn in a, a UR, URL, YouTube, typically, um, and then your shot list or storyboard. So today, we're greenlit, we're getting rolling. Next week, we'll lecture, workshop, we'll go over some of this stuff more. What I really want you doing this weekend is thinking of ideas. If you're gonna work with a partner, talk it through. Um, you could do your shot list or your storyboard over the weekend. And then you'll have a studio field day, a lab day, and a screening. I've had some people that are a little worried they're getting behind. That shouldn't be a concern. We are moving slowly. We don't panic about this stuff. We're gonna have two work days here. So if you're concerned about something, that'll be a great time to sit down with me and look at that stuff, okay? I, the whole point of this class is to show you the basics and build confidence. So we're gonna have two work days on this project so that I can sit with you individually, with your team or you individually, to cover any issues that you might have. And that can be anything from uh, the exposure triangle to focusing to um, whether the shot list or a storyboard makes more sense or maybe it's a post-production thing. Some of you guys have not seen a uh, non-linear editor for more than just a couple of weeks. So I know that there's some people who are worried about, there's a lot of process going on even though we're doing pretty basic uh, functions. But if you, you'll notice, we're about to really start telling stories even though they're, they're simple, we're getting into some really storytelling uh, components now. Um, even with the focus racking, you start seeing how we're telling the audience to go from this character to this character, or from this object to this character or this desire. Um, <clears throat> so even on the second assignment, you're already beginning to, to, to dive into that, that role. So in two weeks, we'll, we'll screen these films. And I believe that October 5th is the same day that this is due. It's, some, it's early October. Does that, is anybody off the top of their head and you don't have to know right now, does anybody think they'll do the competition in conjunction with this assignment? Or is that just too much? That's okay. You don't have to do the competition, I'm just curious. Um, so what I wanna do now <clears throat> is dive into composition uh, and this will be the topic of our discussion for the next two weeks Oh, and a brief reminder, we, do, I, we don't have everything up, but I'm trying to get as many of our lectures up on YouTube, so if you miss class, like I stated at the beginning, I've been ill. Um, a lot of people are getting under the weather. I'm getting more emails about this kind of stuff. Um, if you miss something, we, we most likely have the majority of the lecture on YouTube if it was worth grabbing. It's not uh, the most glamorous, exciting thing to watch, but if you need to catch up on something and you're not sure, this is a great way to find us, um, just a resource for you guys. I can't say that we'll have every single lecture on, uh, but we're trying to get them up as much as possible so that, you know, during the COVID time, I had roughly 40 to 60% attendance uh, three, semest three years ago, this class, every single day. So it was really difficult to keep uh, communicating with everyone. Um, <clears throat> And I simply can't do it all by phone and just catch you up later. So uh, this is a resource for you if you do, in fact, uh, get ill or have to be somewhere. Um, so please take advantage of that. This is not the one. Films are made up of sequences. Sequences are made up of scenes. Scenes are made up of shots. I must understand the characteristics of storytelling value of each shot. Don't be there. In this video, we will begin with the big picture and work our way down. 
We're going to define the essential shot sizes in a filmmaker's toolbox and how to use the right shot at the right time to create memorable moments on screen. This is episode one of The Shot List. It's so quiet. Shot size. Shot choices help establish the rhythm, tone, and meaning of a scene. Knowing which shot will be the most aesthetically and dramatically valuable for a given scene should be the highest priority for both the director and a DP. In this video, we'll be examining essential shot sizes. As we go, we'll populate a shot list in Studio Binder as a sort of cheat sheet the next time you need to create one. Now, let's get to the shot list. The most common visual element to open a scene, or even an entire film, is the establishing shot. It is typically wide enough to establish the geography, time of day, show the scale of subjects in relation to their environment, and is often used to transition between scenes. With genres like science fiction, where entirely new worlds need to be introduced, the establishing shot is crucial. Blade Runner 2049 opens with a series of establishing shots. We get the first impressions of near future Earth with industrial and futuristic farms outside the city. So remember, an establishing shot is a crucial introductory component of any scene. It can mark a transition to a new location, or introduce crucial details about the location or world. The establishing shot is often followed up with the master shot, or simply the master. Like the establishing shot, a master shot confirms the location and geography of the scene. It also clarifies which characters are in the scene and where they are in relationship to each other. Here we see a master from The Godfather Part Two, framing the Corleone family around a dinner table. The majority of this scene is played in the master to emphasize the family's close-knit relationship. Country ain't your blood, you remember that. Until Michael drops some devastating news. Well, if you don't feel like that, why don't you just quit college and go to go to join the army? I did. I enlisted in the Marines. Why, why, why didn't you come to us? What do you mean? I mean, Pop had to pull a lot of strings to get you deferment. I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for deferment. I didn't want it. But it also helps make Michael split from the family visual from this to this. And we feel the emptiness around him that much more. Remember, the master captures the scene playing out in its entirety. Providing the editor with something to cut out to, if necessary. Moving on. Wide shot, WS. Let me tell you about my book. The wide shot positions subjects far from the camera to visually represent their relationship to their environment. This is distinct from the establishing shot, which is about location. The wide shot is principally concerned with the scale of the subject. I'm finished! It will be used when you need to make subjects appear lost, lonely, or overwhelmed, or comment on a subject's relationship to their environment. In this wide shot from Phantom Thread, we can see the characters Alma and Reynolds dwarfed by a messy ballroom. Paul Thomas Anderson could have ended the scene with close-ups to capture their characters' emotions. But by ending with a wide shot here, we can consider Alma and Reynolds together, yet isolated from the world around them. 
Use it when you need to establish the spatial relationships of the subjects. Make statements using distance, depth, or size. Our next subject, full shot. When a subject's entire body reaches from the top to the bottom edges of the frame, the shot is defined as full. With a full shot, it's not necessary to put the subject in the center of the frame, but notice how often this is the case. This example is effective because it is tight enough to tell a story with the character's face, but wide enough to further the story by observing her entire body, posture, and water. So remember, a fool is composed head to toe, and you can use them when you need to make statements about a subject's physicality, and present a character in all their glory. Moving on. Medium full shot, cowboy. The medium full shot is arranged from the top of the subject's head to just below their waist. It is sometimes referred to as a cowboy shot based on the height of gun holsters. Here we can see complementary angles from the favorite, composed in medium falls. The cowboy angle on the character Lady Sarah is particularly strong and confrontational. This isn't a western and features no holsters, but it's hard not to think of cowboys when firearms are deployed like this. Use it when you need to present a subject as confident, dangerous, or confrontational, especially when weapons might be drawn. Moving on. Medium shot, MS. Perhaps the most popular shot size in all of cinema is the medium shot. But why? because it's more of a neutral shot, neither dramatic like a close-up or distancing like a wide shot. It captures the subject in a size similar to how we interact with people. Will you hold still? The typical composition of a medium shot starts above the waist, but below the chest, and ends just above the head. Shot sizes deployed in animated films function under the same compositional rules. Oh! Hello? Let's look at an example to better illustrate this. In this scene from Coco, Miguel watches a film starring his idol. The medium shot composition accommodates quite a bit. The props from Miguel's shrine, the detail on the TV screen, and Miguel's reactions to it. It's an intimate moment as we observe Miguel's joy, along with the objects of his affection in a single frame. Follow my heart. So remember, the typical composition of a medium shot starts above the waist, but below the chest, and ends just above the head. Use it when you need to dig into a subject's eyes without losing their physicality or environment, or utilize a true middle ground approach that is neither jarring nor especially dramatic. Our next subject, medium close-up shot, MCU. When a shot frames a subject from mid-chest to just above their head, it is referred to as a medium close-up. Medium close-ups are about reducing distraction and prioritizing story and character details. Why don't you start right now and get the fuck out of here? Use it when you need to get intimate with a subject without losing their physicality. Perhaps I treated you too harshly. Here, the villainous Thanos snaps his fingers during the climactic moments of Avengers Endgame. With this shot size, we have room for the Infinity Gauntlet, and Thanos' look of cruel satisfaction in thinking he has won. But when he fails, this medium close-up is designed to also capture his reaction. Remember, a medium close-up is roughly head to chest. Are you ready for it? It's the close-up. See you. Here's Johnny. Of course, the most powerful <coughs> weapon for highlighting a change in emotion or dramatic beat on screen. Close-ups are most often arranged at high level, better to dig into the windows of the soul. In this shot size, we have a front row seat for a character's thoughts and feelings. Who is it? 
Republic? Yes, anything. The close-up is about empathy and illustrates how dramatically effective it can be in a time of decision or anxiety. Our final category, extreme close-up shot, ECU. An extreme close-up, or ECU, frames a subject to isolate a specific area. This could be lips, ears, or nose. But the eyes are typically the focus. Like here in Kill Bill Volume 1. As the bride is swarmed by the crazy 88, we cut back and forth between their entry points and her frantic eyes. But when the function of a specific prop or an intimate detail is necessary, filmmakers will often rely on the insert shot. Inserts are most commonly used to highlight and isolate something crucial to the narrative. So remember, an extreme close-up or an insert shot is one of the greatest tools for emphasis. It is the most intimate, dramatic and potentially startling of all shot sizes. So, this is our shot list made in Studio Binder so far. It has all of the most common shot sizes you can reference the next time you need to create a shot list. You can find a link to the full... Okay. <clears throat> So it's a little longer than uh, most of the videos we watch. Um, but essentially what I want for this particular assignment is uh, with your five to 10 shots, I want you to start really wide. I want you to establish where you're at with your location um, and what the environment is. And then you're gonna move inside to the scene and that is gonna show who's involved in this scene. Is it one character? Is it many characters? Which I, I definitely don't recommend for this. Um, and then as you work into that story, uh, you'll end up, and you don't have to land on an extreme close-up like the eye, uh, but I do want emotion, so probably at least a medium close-up. Um, and that's where you can incorporate insert shots throughout, whether it's a gun, pen, cup of coffee, keyboard, whatever it may be. So 10 shots, uh, I, I want to limit you to 10 because it's kind of a challenge to just keep it simple. Um, <clears throat> I don't want you guys to overthink story too much here. I just want you to think visually how you're trying to convey this to your audience. And it can be anything that you want to, want to tell. So let's go back through and let's talk about, well, let's see, actually, I really like this. This, uh, this still at the end has a nice visual for us, which is one of the reasons I just absolutely love Studio Binder. Uh, they just couldn't do better with the references. So we have our establishing um, huge location uh, on the end of a spaceship, and our character is that tiny. And then as you move into the story, you start to understand who that character is and what they're doing and then what emotion that conveys, right? So we start wide, then we go tighter. I wish they had all the people involved in that one. That would be nice. Because in this next shot, your master is very important that you can incorporate the characters involved. And then they even commented on it, but it's, I don't know why it's so quiet. We gotta figure it out. Uh, but um, you can cut back to this shot. And it's something you see a lot of great filmmakers do if they, they might run this angle the entire scene straight through. And then as they're going around, instead of an insert, they might go back to that master and that can convey emotion. So that gives you another weapon. If you have that master shot, you're always wanting to think about your job with this as the cinematographer is to get uh, plenty of, of media, plenty of footage for your editor, which is gonna be you, uh, to cut around. So you wanna make sure you have your coverage. Getting coverage is so imperative. The group from last year, it got to be redundant. Zoe could probably tell you every class I was going, coverage, coverage, coverage. Quit being lazy and get onto this, get everything you can, because you're shooting 1080p on SD cards, get all of it. You can get a lot. Now, a shot list should keep you organized, but we'll dive more into that Tuesday. Um, so thinking coverage, you can run the medium shot straight through the scene and then shoot the scene again on your tights and things like that so that you can always have that to cut back to. So you don't just want to shoot your master 
just wide and get the very intro and then cut and then go in. You might do the whole scene wide, and that also gives your actors a chance to run through the scene a couple of times. <clears throat> then we go to the wide shot. Wide shot usually has most of the scene, entire body, um, but it also encapsulates more than just the characters themselves. So in this case, you can see their isolation from other characters that are silhouetted and even a, a band. And then the wide shot, head to toe, full body, typically. It's not uncommon to see like maybe a, a little bit of the legs cut off or something, you know, if, especially if there's like something in the scene. And we go to the cowboy. Now, this is a, a medium wide, but the cowboy is the way that I like to remember it so well. Do you have a question, Aaron? Yeah. No, OK. Um, because typically, you're going to go just below the waist, just enough that you'd be able to see the guns. And it's just such a common shot. It's been utilized for so long um, that the, uh, the cowboy nickname has really stuck well to it. Our medium shot, medium shots are great because we're starting to see emotion, we're start, but we still have props. We still have elements of the scene. We still have details going on in the set decor, things that still have, uh, uh, in this case also, a practical light shining on his face. Um, medium shots can be really powerful, and often most of your scene will probably be a medium shot, especially conversationally. Medium close-up, <clears throat> conveying more emotion. And one of the things that I want you to notice when you start looking at a medium to a medium close-up, your depth of field starts to become a lot more shallow. From here, everything's in focus. Everything's in focus, everything, all the way. And this one, eh, maybe it just her, it's not a great example. But I can still see like the bushes and, and kind of a, a sharp focus. Here, all, all the candles, the TV, everything is in focus, we get to our nemesis here uh, and our emotion that we want to convey. We want to see his hand, we want to see him, but we don't want to be distracted by everything behind. So we have a more shallow depth of field. And now once we get to that medium close up, that depth of field really tightens up. And we're gonna talk more about that as we go along too. And with the close up, nothing's in focus, but what we need to see. This is the emotion, this is where we want to end up in our scene. We'll start here, telling everyone where we're at, and we're going to work our way into the tears, the laughter, the joy, the fear, whatever it may be. We're going to get ourselves here to that close-up. And then the extreme close-up. I don't use these a lot, um, <clears throat> but they, they, uh, if you really need to focus in on something, I would say an extreme close-up for me ends up being more, and more or less I'm talking about this item and then I cut to it and I just want you to focus on that only. The coffee cup has been poisoned. I just want you to see it. That's really more when I use extreme close-ups, I think, in my own work. Uh, but obviously eyes, very powerful, but objects as well. So utilizing these nine, uh, this is where you're going to have, and you don't have to use each one. That's also important. It's going to be very important that you establish your scene. And I do want you to get here, but if you don't use a cowboy, um, or you don't use, like, say, a, a really wide shot. You don't necessarily have to get there, because the requirement is five. So I want you to start wide, let your audience know what's all encapsulated, and work your way into emotion. OK? It's nothing, I'm not trying to uh, have you guys tell a whole story. You don't have to have an entire short film out of this. Um, it could be just a little snippet. It could be one person going through their daily activities. Uh, or it could be two people going through something. It could be whatever you really want it to be. Uh, it's very open-ended. I do want to go through <clears throat> more specifically and look at some of these. Uh, a lot of times, establishing shots are outside. So if we were doing one for this class, for instance, we'd start outside in the parking lot. If it were me, you could do it however you want. Drones have changed this uh, astronomically. When I was in your seat, they didn't exist. Uh, out in a consumer capacity, and I don't even know that very many um, custom ones were even designed at that time. So you could even have an aerial now of the building, and it'd be so easy to do. Um, then our next shot would come in as a master, showing me at the front, the whole class, you'd want to see everyone involved. And then we'd start going in tighter to individuals as the story developed further. So master shots, a lot of great ones. <clears throat> Again, pretty large depth of field, which means what if it's a large depth of field? What's the focus like? 
It's all sharp. Yeah, you can see all of it. Nothing's blurry, nothing's soft. You guys are being shy. I know you know what this is. Um, everything from here, if you can see my mouse, is, I can tell, I can't tell who individuals are because we're so wide, but I can tell, I can read that says times. I can see that this is a clock that says roughly almost nine o'clock. If this was a shallow depth of field, there'd just be a short little focus, right? So a large depth of field is pretty important for <clears throat> um, your establishing shot. Let me get through. And in this one, um, well, let's play, let's play through. And feature films, it's not uncommon to have multiple uh, establishing shots like they do in Blade Runner that they show here in a second. I don't encourage that in short films at all because you really got to jump into that story fast or you're going to lose your audience or more importantly your submission judges for festivals. You got to get to that story quick so that's why we tend to leave out title sequences and we don't want a lot of establishing. We just want to get into that story. But if you have a two and a half hour epic you got a little more time to establish shots like they're doing here in Star Wars. And then some Blade Runner examples. Um, yeah, a really long movie. Beautiful movie, but very long. And so here's, we can literally see the bolts of this ship all the way down to um, the sharpness in whatever this planet is here. <clears throat> That's interstellar. Okay. I haven't seen that one. So typically a large depth of field and a very wide shot so that we can see who's all included, where, what your atmosphere is. Then our master is so important because this is how your audience knows who everyone is in the scene. They gotta know who's involved. They need to know which characters are there and also their environment. Are they playing a poker game? Are they at a bar? Are they in church? This is really important to establish the location inside or if they're outside, where they're at outside, and who is involved. And in this case, potentially even a, a power struggle or sequence here because one person's standing, others are sitting. A lot can be uh, taken from an established, or from a master shot. Is our depth of field shallow? It's a large depth of field. We can see, I can see the, I can see her face. If I knew who these characters were, I could probably already identify them. And maybe these people back here, um, all the way up to the, the windows. I can, I can see up in that window frame, I can see the edges. <clears throat> so yeah, it's a large depth of field. It's, there's, everything's in focus for the most part. Um, if you even look at whatever's on this bulletin board, couldn't read it, but I could tell you that there's stuff up there. If this was a shallow depth of field, that'd be blurry, so you wouldn't be able to see that so well. And it's okay, like this shot has a pan to it. <clears throat> we haven't got into movements yet, but um, if you'd like to check out a tripod and try some movements, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we'll talk about what those movements mean more in the next assignment though. So uh, iconic scene. From The Godfather, we can see all these different characters, uh, many of them very famous actors now. All the way to the back, the blinds are even sharp. But I can even see like the detail in her dress. So a large depth of field still with our master. I don't want to skip ahead. So this, it's important what's in your scene and what's not in your scene. So in this case, everyone's, as they talked about, they're all together. Um, but we do see that he doesn't have anyone over his shoulder. Where right here, I believe it's his brother, um, has someone directly over his shoulder and people around him. Kind of showing that the energy metaphorically here visually is towards, he's got the weight of the room. Where he doesn't. <clears throat> And then, of course, by the end, it just essentially gets to a point where he's, he's completely isolated. And see how they cut back to that master? 
to show that. They show that as a scene is developed. So cutting back to the master or cutting into an extreme close-up or what we, what we're, uh, anything like that is, is acceptable. You don't have to just go uh, establishing shot to close-up in that sequential order. Um, how you mix that up for your audience is, is up to you. But starting wide and ending close is my way of helping you guys. It's kind of your cheat sheet so you don't overthink it. I want you to let everyone know where you're at and I want you to work into the emotion. And then by the end here, he's, he's on his own. Um, and I don't mind booking, it's actually I really prefer bookending myself where I will usually uh, start with a establishing shot and I like to end with a master to kind of show what just took place. Um, so if there was like a fight and then one person's dead, then you go wide and you show like the repercussion of where everything ended. You can book in with masters really nicely, which is what they did here. Uh, not something that you have to do, but <clears throat> it's one of my, my uh, things that help, it helps me kind of figure out where I'm going with the story. So our wide shots, a lot of negative space in the wide shots, a whole lot of area. You can tell the, the wide shot requires um, quite a bit of location scouting to make sure that you have the space for that. Just go ahead. Okay, as we start moving in, <clears throat> We're seeing from head to toe, full body. But we're still, seeing, we're still seeing a lot of depth in the depth of field too. I can still see the coffee cup over there in focus. The cowboy, I kind of talked about that. It's pretty obvious. The cowboy is probably the easiest one to really remember outside of the ones on the ends been done forever. Now medium shot, as I stated, this is where a lot of your dialogue is going to take place. Waist up. We've already seen where they're at. We know who's in the scene. Um, this is a really important way to keep your audience, that to, this is where most of your story development will take place because you're developing the emotion that you'll eventually work to in your extreme or into your close-ups. But this medium, I can see it. We call this a we call this a dirty because who he's talking to, we can see his shoulder. If we couldn't see him, then that would be a clean shot, and it would just be our character here, um, and likely not even his weapon too. It's typically sternum up is pretty common, or waist up, depending on how they're how they're sitting or standing or whatever. And, and it's important to point out, um, I know everyone in here is studying this particular major, but animation, the rules are the same. You'll still see focus racking. You'll st still see camera panning and tilting and zoom in and zoom out. Uh, and in this case also, uh, the storyboarding class is taught by Blair in the animation and game uh, development department. But you can, you can storyboard films in there too. Uh, the rules still apply all the same when it comes to these uh, visual aesthetics that we're, we're trying to convey to our audience. <clears throat> that was a great movie if you guys haven't seen it. Uh, this is just a gorgeous shot because we have so much going on. I don't know if you've seen it, but this is his idol. Um, lit with all this wonderfully warm light but contrasted well with the TV. Um, that guitar in focus, 
Being still a medium shot, we can see this is a poster of this guy still in focus. If this was a medium close-up, just our very next step in, all that stuff would be soft and then we would only be focusing in on him and maybe his guitar. Uh, we wouldn't have all these elements that we could see. Uh, here's another record from this guy. This is a, this large depth of field is still conveying a whole lot of information through the set decor uh, that eventually, whereas we push into the emotion, we won't need to know this all the time. You've now gathered this knowledge. And so your audience can get tighter for more emotion. Okay. So great example for the medium close-up. Nothing else is in focus. Shallow depth of field. Just our main character. Um, I don't know what this is. The favorite. So we can tell those are candles, likely. I haven't seen the movie. But you can't actually tell exactly what that is because everything is so soft. I mean, even the back of her chair, which is kind of hard for you to see, is soft focus. So once we hit that, we've hit this threshold of um, our depth of field changing so that we can convey that emotion even more powerfully. Look at that. Nothing, nothing in here is in focus. Nothing on the walls. Just that emotion. We're just capturing that. <clears throat> it's a great shot. And this one too, we've, we already know who these guys are. We've been in this scene long enough at this point um, before he gets to this level of emotion that we don't really need to have everything in focus. Is this making sense? I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but I just want to make sure you guys are pretty tired. This scene too, candles are out of focus. Can't see, I don't know if that's an exit sign or what. I assume so. Remember, he was just in focus when he was snapping his fingers. Uh, everything around him was. Sorry, it wasn't. I said that incorrectly. Because at this point, you've been in that battle. We've watched like 20 of these stupid movies at this point. We know what's going on behind him. It's OK to have it all in soft focus, right? Oh, we got to see the one from The Shining. I mean, that's given like millions of people nightmares for decades. That close-up shot <clears throat> has been replicated. I think it was even done like a Mountain Dew commercial not too long ago. Super shallow depth of field. In fact, I think on her, I don't even think her ears are in focus. Like, I think it's literally right here. Nose is soft, ear is soft. That is as shallow of a depth of field as you could probably get away with. We're talking about like that much is in focus on, on the, that area, which makes for what we call bokeh, where the lights do this different effect. It's really cool. And as they state, I didn't think about this uh, I, don't, I guess it doesn't. I always want the eyes myself, usually on the top third when we start talking about composition. And we'll talk about rule of thirds more on Tuesday. Um, I really like the eyes on that top third. I don't want them down here unless there's like specific reason for that. Start thinking about that placement, how you block your actors within the frame. Um, so I'm glad they mentioned that because that wasn't something I had in my notes. But the eyes towards the top, think about how your audience is conveying this. If it's a close up, you want it to be as real as possible, as if they're like looking straight at you. So oftentimes those close-ups are not just the eyes on the top third, but also eye level. It doesn't have that. There's always exceptions, but that's something to consider. Again, conversational scene doesn't mean that your conversation has to be in medium. This very emotional scene is in a close-up, but we still have a dirty because Harrison Ford's character is so important in this particular scene. And the extreme close-up, which, like I said, I don't use 
too often because it is just that. It's highly extreme. Uh, but sometimes you really, if you really want to get that point across and you don't want there to be any confusion for your audience to look at anything else, that extreme close-up is, is very powerful. I really like it for insert shots of objects that need to be conveyed in the scene. So when you have like a fight and someone reaches for a knife, you might do an insert shot of that close-up of that knife so you can see where that desire is and what they're focused on. If I did a master and there's a knife somewhere in that scene, your audience is going to be confused. So make sure your job is to make it easy for your audience to understand the story you're trying to tell them. <clears throat> okay, any questions about where we're at right now? You got more time on this assignment than you have on the others, so we're gonna we're gonna take an extra an extra weekend on it, basically. So for the weekend, think about if you're gonna work with someone, talk it over. Um, Think about what you want to convey, what story you want to use, where you want to shoot it at. Uh, Tuesday, I'm going to go into more detail on what the shot list will look like or storyboarding. You're welcome to storyboard. I just personally am not big on storyboarding myself. Um, it's not because it's wrong or bad. It's just the, the, my professional workflow tends to use shot list for almost everything. It's very, very uh, important that you use one or, or the other. And then we're also going to talk about on Tuesday how we what we're doing when we frame a shot and how, what we call that. So like a medium close-up is an MCU. I'll go over that detail with you guys then too. I don't want to throw too much of you at once. Right now, think of what kind of story you want to tell. It can be very, very, very basic. It can be you in your kitchen cooking and you start wide and you work your way in. Um, it can be something funny, it can be something scary. Uh, this is a chance for you to get outside the box a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, they do the same stuff, like if you're the football guys, when they do hype videos, the same rules kind of apply. Start wide on the stadium and work your way into, you know, helmets crashing kind of thing. So no matter what you're doing, this is one of the, the way that you're going to approach this, starting wide and working into that emotion, um, is a really great way to, to uh, convey a message to your audience. So, cool. Have a good rest of your morning. Thanks, guys.